Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us here at the Alliance for our live Facebook discussion on a new third line treatment for patients with metastatic colorectal cancer. This new FDA approved regimen can provide better health outcomes for metastatic CRC patients who have undergone two previous forms of treatment. We're excited to explain this option to you today and answer any questions. I'm Marianne Pearson. I'm the Senior Director of Patient Navigation with the Colorectal Cancer Alliance. Some housekeeping items before we begin. Dr. Marshall, David Fenstermarker, and I will save some time at the end of the broadcast to answer any questions from the audience. Please add your questions to the comment section below. We encourage you to share this Facebook Live on your own timeline to help raise awareness of this disease and inspire conversations. And finally, a shout out to Taiho, Oncology for providing educational support for our program today. I now like to take the opportunity to share with you our speaker with you today's topic of conversation. Dr. Marshall of Georgetown University is a global leader in research and development of drugs for colon cancer and other GI cancers. He is the principal investigator of over 150 clinical trials and the at the local as well as the national level. Dr. Marshall is the Clinical Director of Oncology for Georgetown University Hospital, Associate Director for Clinical Care of the Lombardi Comprehensive Cancer Center and Chief of the Division of Hematology Oncology. He is also an incredible advocate and advisor for the Colorectal Cancer Alliance. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Marshall. Also joining us today is D David Fenstermarker, the Alliance's Senior Director of Research and Medical Affairs a highly motivated biomedical researcher with over 18 years of senior management experience. David brings significant expertise to the Alliance and our community. Thank you for being here with us, David. Without further ado, let's get started, Dr. Marshall. Marianne, thank you so much. And thanks for everybody for joining in on our Facebook Live, whatever that means, uh, kind of way to show things. But um, anyway, welcome to my office. This is uh, a Tuesday. It's a clinic day around here. So I'll put that white coat on a little bit later today. But the job today for the three of us is really to kind of drill down on some new data, share with the colon cancer community so that they too can be empowered to have these discussions with their own team members to understand the background of why this is important and exciting. And we all thought it would be useful for me to kind of give a quick high level overview of where we're talking about here. And so with the next slide, go ahead and we will um, really show you big picture trends that you probably are aware of. First, we're seeing this dramatic shift in younger and younger patients. And this is um, still unclear about why this is happening. In fact, if you're interested, our annual symposium, let me line it up there, is this week where we're focusing on nothing other than why this young phenomenon is happening. And it is driving more research and investment because we're all needing to figure this out quicker and quicker. But secondly, there's a lot more genetics going on. We're doing a lot more individualizing of colon cancer treatment based on the gene profiles of the individual patient's tumor. Third, we're really a team sport. We're doing a lot more surgeries on metastatic disease, liver-directed therapies, uh, and the like, which is really leading the way among all cancers in this kind of multidisciplinary strategy uh, to try and help patients uh, live longer, live better. But as a result of all of this action, there's a lot of creativity going on, but a lot less consistency. So you might get differences of, of opinion at one cancer center versus another about what is the right thing to do. So that leads to a lot of confusion and unsettledness among all of us. Next slide, please. And let's drill down with the next slide to kind of talk about what we have to know today. So every colon cancer patient, particularly stage four, needs to know MSI status. This is a gene test, RAS, BRAF, HER2, and then some less common ones done, INTREC and CTDNA. All of these are important to know. And I would argue that if you're a colon cancer patient out there with stage four disease, you need to know whether you're positive or negative on all of these markers. Next slide, please. 
And the reason is, is that the disease is more than one disease now. Not only do we think about it differently depending on which gene is broken in the tumor, but we're also, believe it or not, care whether or not it's on the right side of the colon or the left side of the colon, et cetera. So we've begun to sort us from one big family into our different branches of our family. And so you as a patient need to know which branch of the family tree you're on. Next slide, please. So we now look at it differently. It's not one organ, it's at least two, it's maybe three organs with regard to treatment and treatment options. So next slide, please. So now the pie chart is getting more and more complicated with which part are you? Still the largest group of these RAS mutations up at the top, that green wedge of the pie up there, but we're beginning to see progress in even treating those kinds of tumors. Next slide, please. So when you make a decision as a doc, I said there was a lot of variability because we have to integrate all of these different components to an individual patient's characteristics. So what about them? What medical problems does the patient have? How much support, honestly, does the patient have behind them? How big is their village? Uh, how much tumor is there? Where is the tumor? The gene testing that I was describing before, and then the patient's priorities, uh, which uh, is in general wanting to do the best they can with their disease. Next. So we take all of this and then we look at, okay, here's the chessboard of drugs that we have for the treatment of metastatic colon cancer. That first column is drugs that you may be familiar with. We're going to come back to one that VEGF1, that's a drug we're going to talk about a little bit later called Bevacizumab or Avastin. But those in that first column don't have a gene that tells us yes or no. The second column, absolutely, only about 15% of patients are eligible for those two medicines because they have to have very specific gene profiles. The same is true for the third column. That's only 9% of everybody is in on that. And the last column is rarer still, HER2, maybe 3%, MSI, maybe somewhere around 3%, and TREC, rarer still under 1%. So we have to know the chessboard and your gene test helps us decide what drugs are in, what drugs are out. Next slide, please. So then we begin thinking about lines of therapy, treatment options, what pieces are on the chessboard based on these different mutations that I just reviewed for you. So not all drugs are for everyone. And I think that confuses patients when there's a press release or something, somebody shouts out a, a new innovation in a particular cancer. Well, that only matters if you have the appropriate gene test, which is why everyone should know their appropriate gene test. Next slide, please. So then you start about, okay, I'm gonna give what we call first line treatment or your initial treatment. And there's good data for giving only two drugs. There's good data for three. A lot of patients get three drugs when they first start, but there's also really good data for four drugs kind of piling on at that first line of therapy. And let me show you on, on the next slide a study. Um, this was done in Asia, but it's a very, very important study where it's four drugs versus four drugs in first line treated uh, colon cancer. But the difference is one of the drugs targets that EGFR receptor and the other targets VEGF. So on the next slide, this is the punchline. So you know what you're looking at. Each one of those columns, those lines, is an individual patient. And the middle, zero, is where they started. That was how much cancer they had when they started. And if the line goes down, the tumor shrunk by that much. So if you look all the way over to the right, all of those lines reach all the way to 100%. That means the cancer went away from sight with just the chemotherapy, which is a very, what we'll call a complete response. But you can see that almost everybody with this four drug recipe, their tumor shrunk. Only a few patients, those few columns over there on the left, did the tumor grow with the initial therapy. And then the next point about this was that the four drugs with the drug cetuximab, that's the orange ones, they were lower. The depth of response, how much the tumor shrunk, was more 
with that four drug combination versus the other one, if you can see that uh, coming through on this curve. So it says, yeah, I can make your tumor shrink, comes at a side effect cost of rash and things like that. So when we make these decisions, we're making decisions based on well, how much do we want it to shrink, what side effects are going to be caused by that, and how best to pick patients for which treatments. Next slide. Then we back off to what's called maintenance therapy. And this will really be important um, with our study that we're talking about today. The idea that, okay, we shrunk the tumor, but now if we just keep pounding patients with chemotherapy, it doesn't really shrink a lot more after that initial time. So let's keep the cancer from regrowing by just giving easier chronic therapy. In this case, an oral medicine, capecitabine, with this important drug we're going to talk about in a minute called bevacizumab. And this maintenance approach makes it sort of easier to control the cancer. Quality of life is better and clearly is better than doing nothing. Next slide, please. So some subtypes. Everyone's heard about immune therapy for colon cancer. Next slide, please. This subset of patients known as MSI high, lots of patients are aware of this, uh, was demonstrated that immune therapy, this is the drug Keytruda or pembrolizumab, compared to chemotherapy was pretty interesting. Next slide, please. So half the patients got just pembrolizumab. Now remember, you had to have this right gene test in order to be eligible for this. And this is only about three to 5% of the total versus chemotherapy. Next slide. And what you could see the green line is how long patients stayed stable or better with just the pembrolizumab. Whereas the other color, the, the sort of maroon line, is the patients who got chemotherapy and not pembrolizumab. And if you'll show the next slide, what I really want to emphasize here is not only the positive of the green line, all right? So a lot of patients, half the patients were stable at two years with just a single medicine, this immune therapy medicine. But not everybody was positive, right? What happened to the 50% that had whose tumors didn't respond? And this is where we have to balance our excitement for immune therapy against the reality that we still got more learning to do about how to pick up those other 50% who have that same uh, molecular test but didn't respond to the immune therapy. So more research to come even in this MSI high group of patients. Next slide, please. So most of us don't have MSI high colon cancer. We have microsatellite stable colon cancer. And I just want to show you a quick peek, next slide, of a study looking at two immune therapies. I won't get into the weeds of how these work, but in essence, they're cutting the brakes on the immune system. Your immune system is trying to kill the cancer, but the cancer is preventing the immune system from seeing it. And all these drugs do is make it so they can now see the immune system, can now see the cancer. So if you put these two drugs together, the next slide, you see a, what we call these waterfall plots, not nearly as impressive as the one I showed you before, but for this kind of approach, we'll take it. These are patients who are responding, who before immune therapy never worked before, still not the majority, but this is where the work is going. Next slide. And if you were a responder, this is what's called a spider plot. So each one of the lines is a patient. And if the tumor shrunk, the line goes down below zero. And then the longer that line is still there, it means how long the patient responded. So when you have a spider plot that looks like this, that's good. That means if the drug worked, it worked for a while for these patients. Um, so this is encouraging early data in the immune therapy space for the non-MSI patients. Next slide, please. I mentioned before EGFR targeting, cetuximab, panitumumab. And if you'll go to the next slide, let me show you the evolution that this took now 20 years. So cetuximab was approved in 2020, 2004. Now, just to make it kind of a fun story, Martha Stewart went to jail for insider trading because of cetuximab. That'll, those of you who are old like me, you'll remember that moment. Um, but if you look at it at the beginning, this is the beauty of what this precision medicine is doing for us. If you just had receptors, all colon cancer patients have these receptors 
for these drugs, that first row there. But the response, if I give it to every colon cancer patient, was only around 10%. Now, when you're thirsty in the desert, this is water. You're going to try it. But if you look down, we then figured out that if you had a RAS mutation, if your tumor had a RAS mutation or a BRAF mutation or was on the right side or was HER2 positive, all of a sudden, fewer and fewer patients fit that category. But if you look at how many patients benefited, it goes through the roof. So instead of giving it to everybody for 10%, we're now giving it to 15% of patients for those very impressive 80% plus response rates. Right patient, right drug. The problem I feel about this is that this took too long to figure out. Think about all the patients who were receiving this drug where it didn't work because we didn't know this. I feel guilty about that pretty much every day. Next slide, please. The same is true for BRAF, next slide, because this is a target that's below that receptor. So if you think about the light switch over there on my wall and the lights are above, right? There are a bunch of wires that go from that light switch to the light up there. Now, one way is to just take the bulb out and break it, right? That's a lot of times what our chemotherapy does is just break the bulb and turn the light off. But some of our drugs turn the light switch off. And that's where this receptor thing is. That's the light switch. But believe it or not, there are two light switches over there and they both have to be off in order for it to go. And then there are a bunch of wires behind the wall, okay? So not only in colon cancer do I have to hit the light switch with, say, cetuximab, but I give a second drug, this BRAF drug called incarafenib, to cut one of the wires behind the wall to make sure that that light goes off, all right? And so we need to hit these pathways more than once in order to solve this problem. So next slide. If I hit it three times, I get this. Almost everybody with a BRAF mutation, their tumor shrunk, right? Everybody know how to read one of these now? The, everybody who's down means their tumor got smaller with these three drugs. So next slide. Big study was done looking at three drugs, hit the wire three times, hit the wire twice, or use traditional chemotherapy and only hit the wire once. Um, and so if you looked at this, next slide, we actually showed that hitting it twice was just as good as hitting it three times, believe it or not. It didn't add that much to do that. So we have approved drugs for if you have a BRAF mutation, hit the wire twice, hit the pathway twice, and you get good responses. Next slide, please. RAS is really a problem. So there are some RAS mutations that we've been able to target, but they're rare. We are working very hard. So a lot of you out there have a tumor with a RAS mutation. Do you remember that big wedge of the pie? Almost half of colon cancer patients have one of these RAS mutations in their tumor. And we need to figure it out fast as we can. Next slide. We have it. HER2 is a success story. You may know about HER2 because of uh, breast cancer, for example. But next slide. In colon cancer, there's not that many if you look at the whole pot. So if you look at those pie charts there in the bottom left, if you look at all colon cancer, you only get a 2 to 3% sliver of red there. But if you go across to the third one, if you look in left-sided, RAS wild type, normal, BRAF normal, then that's where they're all hiding, the HER2s. So we are learning who to look for this target in. Next slide, please. Because when you give drugs that target HER2, this is a single arm study, no randomization. Everybody got the drug. The only thing is you had to be HER2 positive to get into this trial. Next slide. It demonstrated a very good positive waterfall plot so that now the majority of patients' tumors shrink. The duration of the response was a long time, about a year. So uh, even though it's a rare subgroup of patients, these therapies got FDA approval based on just about 60 patients in a clinical trial um, demonstrating this benefit. Next slide. A new interesting hot drug is one of these smart bombs. So this is not only is it hitting the receptor, is hitting the light switch, but it's bringing along with it a, well, they actually call it a warhead. It bothers me, but it's a chemotherapy target molecule that's attached to this thing. So when it sticks 
to the cancer, that's what the thing is designed to do is stick to the cancer. It brings along with it toxin, a poison that kills the cell. And not only kills that cell, it kills the ones in its neighborhood. All right. More like a cluster bomb. I wish we didn't know all of these words, but we do. Um, and so, but the idea behind it is very effective in cancer medicine. And these, this drug, next slide, has shown a nice positive benefit. Next slide after that, just to get to our good waterfall plot, right? So if you're HER2 positive and you use this medicine, a lot of tumor regression is seen in these patients. So these are all right drug, right patient, good progress. Next slide, please. But let's look at those things that are out there for the rest of us. You've had your initial therapy. Most of us don't have one of those markers, or even if you do, those marker treatments eventually uh, don't do everything they need us to do. And so what we're going to shift gears to a little bit is this main topic, and we're going to close our brief discussion with this. And so David, why don't you take it away here and kind of walk us through this new drug, trifluridine, tipracil, TAS-102, Lonsurf, and teach us a little bit about how it works. Sure. Thanks, John. Uh, first of all, uh, first-line chemotherapy options for metastatic colorectal cancer have involved fluoropyrimidines for many years. And many of you may be very familiar with something called 5-fluorouracil or 5-FU, which is a common component of different regimens such as Fulfox, Fulfury, as well as Fulfox Uri. So very common, been used for many, many years. Trifluoridine is a thymidine analog that inhibits cell growth by affecting DNA synthesis. It was developed by Heidelberger and colleagues back in 1964, so it has been around quite a while, as an alternative to 5-fluorouracil. First, trifluorouridine inhibits the production of deoxythymidine triphosphate. This is a major part or a major molecule in DNA. And during, a, during DNA replication, as the cell divides, basically you will have to create deoxythymidine triphosphate, or DTTP. One of the things that trifluoridine does is that it inhibits a molecule. That it creates the conversion of uh, one monophosphate to triple monophosphate. And so therefore you cannot create pyrimidine triphosphate or de deoxythymidine triphosphate, excuse me. And so therefore you don't have pyrimidine synthesis, therefore you're inhibiting DNA. But what happens when you do this is you take another molecule that is a precursor of this DNA replication molecule and you take that from one phosphate to three phosphates. So it's now deoxyuracil triphosphate. When this particular molecule is incorporated into DNA during DNA synthesis, this creates DNA damage. And it also creates a situation where the cell is unable to repair that DNA damage due to the fact there is now a uracil rather than a thymidine. So it's just a simple molecule substitution that has a profound effect on the DNA replication and the ability for the cell to divide. What tends to happen in this case is, since the cell cannot repair itself, the cell will now die. But trifluoridine has some other uh, mechanisms of action that you don't see with molecules like 5-fluorouracil. In addition to being able to incorporate uracil into DNA instead of thymidine, this molecule, trifluorouridine, can also be triple phosphorylated and be incorporated into the DNA, much like the uracil, again, not being a normal molecule in DNA replication, and therefore the DNA repair mechanism cannot work again, and the cell will basically die because it cannot repair this DNA and cannot then divide. So this is a really exciting mechanism, and it has multiple modes of action, but one of the problems is, is that trifluoridine, when you give it in the body, whether it be a pill or an injection, tends to be degraded fairly quickly by, again, another molecule. And so how can we prevent the trifluoridine from being degraded such that it can have an active effect on the cancer cells itself? And that's where 
tipracil comes in. Tipracil basically inhibits the degradation of trifluorouridine, making it more bioavailable to the tumor cells and the cancer cells, allowing the effects to basically take effect and the cell dies. Interestingly enough, though, tipracil also has other effects other than just inhibiting the degradation of trifluorouridine. It also has anti-angiogenic effects. And so what does that mean? So when a tumor is growing, one of the things that it needs is additional oxygens to be able to continue to grow. And so blood vessels are created such that blood can get into the tumor and basically feed that tumor. Tipracil has an anti-angiogenic effect, meaning that it prohibits new blood cells from growing into the tumor and even regresses blood cells that are already present such that now blood and oxygen are not able to readily get to the tumor. Again, causing stress on the tumor and the tumor microenvironment and leading to cell death. And so this is a multifactorial combination that allows for different ways of destroying cancer cells. And this is why it makes it much different than previous treatments such as 5-fluorouracil because of its multiple mode of actions it's multiple ways of damaging DNA as the cell is replicating and therefore causing cell death. So, that's, that's and then great. that's great. Thank you. No, so that's a, a great, in, but let's look at the clinical trial that actually then was done, the initial study that was done. This drug had actually been on the shelf a long time and it was resurfaced. Um, uh, uh, by uh, the uh, Taiho Pharmaceuticals and developed and the initial clinical trial is in front of you. It's actually a randomized study. So patients with metastatic colon cancer, we call it two to one randomization, meaning of every three patients, two got drug, but one got placebo. So this is a placebo controlled trial. It was done around the world with patients with cancer. Next slide, please. And so the group that got the Lonserf, which is its other name, TAS-102 or trifluoridine tipracil, we often call Lonserf. The yellow line is the survival of patients who got the medicine uh, versus the white line is those who got placebo. So it was an extension of survival by a couple of months. And this data is pretty old at this point. You can see that was published in 2015. And we've had these, this drug around for quite some time. Next slide. One of the things I like to look at is something called progression-free survival. This is what I tell a patient. And if you follow that yellow line down, this is when does your cancer progress, get worse. And so if you fall off the curve, if you will, your cancer has grown and you go on to something else. So the placebo line, as you might imagine, at the first scan done at two months, uh, almost everybody, 80% of patients came off the study right away as their tumor grew within the first couple of months. But if you look at the yellow line, about half of the patients were caught by this drug. And, and if you go out the yellow line by six months, about 20, 25% of patients are still on it at six months. So this was meaningful. This was positive. Um, it, we want more. Absolutely, we want more than this. But this was one step on the stairs to improving survival. So next slide, please. So then comes this study. We had already observed in a smaller study that if you took the lawn surf and added it to bevacizumab, now that's known as a Vastin. Many of you have been on this drug. It's used in first line therapy, second line. David was talking about anti-angiogenic therapies. This was the, this was the original long time ago and it blocks the ability of the blood supply to do its thing, to supply tumors, maybe to metastasize. We also think it may be an immune enhancer on some level. But if we go to the next slide, it basically was a, again, now a one-to-one -one randomization, no placebo here. You either got Lonserf or you got Lonserf plus Avastin, plus Bevacizumab, uh, the two together. And if we go to the next slide, um, these were the results. Now, all of a sudden, the delta's at three months. 
And remember, this is not against placebo. This is against an active drug, right? So this was a really big jump for us. It's whenever we, as soon as we saw this being presented at our ASCO GI meeting in San Francisco earlier this year, we actually said, that's meaningful. That counts, that curve. And if you'll go to the next slide, this is the PFS, progression-free survival curve. So note that the white curve is the one lawn surf by itself, and it mirrors the one from the previous study at about 50%. That's where you see it taking off, right, leveling out there. But if you look at the blue curve, that's approaching 80% of patients who with this two-drug combination are stabilizing their cancer and for a much longer period of time. Um, and remember, these are patients, almost all of whom had had prior Avastin. So this wasn't the first time they were seeing both of these drugs. It was the first time they were seeing Lonserf, but not the first time they were seeing Bevacizumab. So that basically is the punchline of our entire one hour webinar today is to make sure that the colon cancer community has seen these data it does change standard of care. This is a new FDA approved regimen. And uh, from a physician's perspective who does GI cancers, I know this data. I know this is going on. But if I'm a general oncologist where there were, I don't know, 100 new medicines approved for cancer in general over the last year or so, I might not know this data. So you might say, well, why isn't my doctor giving me this? It's possible they don't know about this data, mm -hmm. these data. And so part of what we're doing today is making sure that everyone is comfortable with what we're telling you and that you're aware and maybe do some coaching tips on how best to uh, deal with this. Yeah, that was going to be my question to you, Dr. Marshall, is with this, with this new information, um, and if you're currently diagnosed with metastatic colorectal cancer, what should a patient's next steps be? Yeah, so first, I want everybody to remember, we want you to know your own molecular profile. Yeah. Do you have a RAS mutation? Are you BRAF? Are you MSI, et cetera? Now, all that being said, this regimen we just showed you does not require any being a member of any specific one of those families you, any colon cancer patient with stage four disease is a candidate for this treatment. Usually this treatment is used after the first one or two kinds of treatment. So the third line is what we think about. If you reflect back on the maintenance concept I, I talked to you about earlier, this doesn't cause a lot of shrinkage, but it stabilizes the cancer for a long period of time. So we want patients to be aware that this is an option. Um, and we want you to be able to, you know, if, if you're not offered the two drugs together, make sure you talk with your team there about that. Um, there are some reasons not to get Avastin. There are certain risks of having a recent stroke, a heart attack, significant problems with wound healing, blood pressure that's really hard to control. There are some reasons where the safety or side effects is such that the doc may say, I, I see the data, but I don't think it's safe to give you the medicine. That's legit. Um, but for most of us, that's not in play. And so this should be incorporated to, to your treatment. You spoke um, earlier about how some doctors might not have all this information. Is there a difference between a community setting versus the academic setting? How can our patients advocate for themselves and talk to their doctors, no matter the setting, about this and make sure that everyone has up-to-date information? Yeah. I mean, I think that's a, a great question. We are all one medical family and we all support each other. So that's first. Um, when you talk about academic centers, quote unquote, academic centers, comprehensive cancer centers, et cetera, we have a critical mass of, of a team that can just focus on GI cancers, including our surgeons and radiation doctors and the like. But for the most part, those are in cities. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you live in a town of 100,000, 50,000 people, you have outstanding cancer care, don't get me wrong, but the people in your community take care of everything that's going on. Right. And so 
it's not that they don't care that they're not trying. It's just there's so much new information. I joke with my fellows that I'm training. <laughs> I've been doing this a long time. When I first took my oncology boards a thousand years ago, I could actually memorize pretty much everything I needed to know mm -hmm. to pass the test. Mm -hmm. and when you talk about oncology, hematology, oncology today, there's too much there to know. There's a reason why they all let us look stuff up on the internet in our board questions, because there's so many gene variations and subtleties, and it changes so quickly that it's almost impossible to keep up. So yes, we are proud, back to your question. Yes, we are proud about what we know. Yes, we are busy and don't wanna be bugged, but we, yes, we wanna provide the best care we can provide, right? So when a patient brings in to any of us information, right? What about this I read? Um, you have to do that politely. You have to do that um, with grace because you have to remember a lot of times what people are bringing in to us is that their uncle Sam says that if they take coffee enemas on Tuesdays that they'll be cured of their cancer. So we have to deal with those comments as well as the new New England Journal paper. I, I'm sort of half joking with all of that, but there are, there's a lot of advice that all of us uh, hear from our patients about. But this is one where I think you can go in and say, do you see this? This was cool. Am I a candidate for this? To me is the way to ask that. Okay. So doctors don't get offended if you bring in uh, a Oh yeah, we might. We we might. But, <laughs> but, <laughs> but we, we hate it when we're wrong. Let's put it that way. <laughs> You got to make the doc feel like they they knew already and, and all right, all right. their idea in the first place. Sort of like, <laughs> you know, spouses deal with one another. I think yeah. it's a very good, good sort of level to deal with it. Great. Um, with this new uh, treatment um, regimen, is there anything that stands out in regards to side effects that patients should know? Yeah. I mean, David kind of walked us through some of the mechanism okay issues, but not so much how that then has an impact. So David was talking about how it kills cancer cells um, by keeping DNA repair from, from doing its thing correctly. Um, and so cells couldn't divide as well. Well, we all have cells that have to divide to keep us going, need to be replenished. And the main one we worry about with this drug is your white blood cells and your platelets and your red blood cells. So bone marrow side effects. Okay. Um, you, you know, in GI cancers, colon cancer, we don't worry too much about low blood counts. There are some cancers where the recipes really send the counts down um, uh, and the like, but not so much. So this drug, you have to watch out for it. Um, uh, it's, it's dosed orally. Um, uh, it's dosed twice a day. Uh, there's some tricks to dosing that can maybe improve that, but really low blood counts is the biggest one. The second one though, many of our patients have been used to taking capecitabine or Zolota, oral fluoropyrimidine, a cousin of the 5-FU David talked about before. And when we give capecitabine, people get you know hand foot syndrome, but no nausea, no, none of that. Lawn surf can cause nausea and tiredness. And so we do need to make sure our patients are aware that it has side effects. It has chemo-like side effects, nausea, tiredness, and low blood count. The Avastin bevacizumab, almost every patient by this point in the U.S. at least has had this drug. So you already know about it. It's sort of high blood pressure, nose bleeding is a risk. There's some other things that are on the list. Um, but most people at this point have already experienced bevacizumab and sort of the side effects of that. Right. Great, thank you. Is there any um, anything that you could think of that is top priority for patients to ask their doctors? Any specific question that you would recommend? Well, it's back to knowing your own tumor. So, you know, we want as much as possible. And of course, the people on this are those are trying to get informed. But there are a lot of people whose lives or whose dealing with the medical community is such that they just, you know, there's trust and, and you you tell me what to do. Right. Um, and we're, we'll do that if that's the way you want us to, to take care of you. But the more that you know about your tumor, the, no, the more you know about um, how you're feeling, how you're doing, 
um, the better the care will be. Um, and we do welcome that um, uh, interaction. Um, it does make our jobs easier. Don't wait right. three weeks to tell your doctor that you've been sick for three weeks. Right. Tell them right away. Tell the team right away that you're having trouble so they can make adjustments because you want to optimize the use of these medicines. There isn't a one size fits all. Lots of patients get dose modifications, things like that as we go along. And so tell us as soon as you're experiencing those so we can make those mods. Yeah, I definitely think sometimes patients are hesitant to honestly talk about their side effects because they're afraid that they'll be, they'll have to change treatment and they hear such good things. So um, I really appreciate you saying, just be honest, be as um, early in the process as possible to talk to your, your care team about what you're experiencing. Now, one other thing that maybe the pandemic has allowed um, is we do a lot more, you know, we talked about community versus uh, you know, bigger, you know, specialized groups. We support each other a lot. Okay, mm -hmm. so I had two emails this morning from community docs that I know well who ran a quick case by me. Mm -hmm. They were kind of struggling with a decision. And, you know, we, ju we just pinged each other to, to mm -hmm. see what we would do. Um, a lot of times we'll do formal televisits. I'll have patients in our sort of more rural areas of this region, in the mid-Atlantic region, who get seen by friends, colleagues in the community but who every now and then will zoom in on a televisit and kind of check in. And the, the local doc is very happy for that kind of relationship because they're continuing to be the primary team, but we serve as sort of intermittent consultants on these things. So that's normal. I just want people to know that that's, that is those kinds of uh, uh, setups are, are pretty common. Um, and so if that feels like it might be a good fit for them, you know, seek that out. See if you can figure out how to do that. That's great to know that their doctors are reaching out to others to do the best that they can for them. It's great also to hear you reconfirm that a second opinion or reaching out to another doc is, is pretty standard practice. It, it really helps patients and families feel more comfortable and confident in their care. So thank you for that. Um, we have a couple questions from the audience. Are you ready for that, Dr. Marshall? Well, David, too. I'm hoping. Oh, David. All right. Yes, yeah, David. Okay. So the one that I have, um, oh, Dr. Marshall treated my husband in 2003. Let me read this before. In a clinical trials, is genetic testing available for all of these mutations without a tumor? We have a strong family history of CRC and our son has a polyp at 24. We did a genetic test for Lynch, FAP and BRCA. All were negative. I think I'm happy for David to add in on this too. I think what this, ask, this questioner is asking is a very important distinction between testing the tumor and testing the patient. Okay, so the tumor is a cancer because of mutations. Mutations happen, the wiring gets all out of whack and the cells don't work normally. Those are tumor mutations, okay? Well, sometimes we can blame stuff on our parents. I know most of us do, but one of the things we could blame on our parents is did we inherit a mutation? Mm -hmm. And this Lynch syndrome and BRCA mutations that the writer refers to are inherited mutations. And so mm -hmm. those are in every one of our cells. So you can spit in a cup today and or a blood test today, and you could tell whether or not you have one of those. Now, 2000, what was the year three? Um, I think we didn't even have computers back then. We still used abacuses. So, you know, <laughs> the gene tests that are being done today are in fact different, broader, mm -hmm than the gene tests that were done in 2003, 21 years, 20 years ago, okay? So there, there's actually, if you're one of those patients who was tested then with strong family history, et cetera, a lot of times we're recommending repeating it because the test itself has changed and that doesn't need tumor. Now, the second part of the question though is, what about the tumor? 
it's still probably in a basement of a pathology department somewhere. The, the national rules on that are to keep it at least 10 years, and many pathology departments will store them forever unless they run out of space. Um, now, but the problem is, is the longer it sits in the basement of the pathology department, the less good it is uh, for genetic testing. Some of that information gets eroded and, and, and degraded. And so um, it's not as reliable as it was back then. So no two different tests. One is for the tumor to help guide us for treatments. The other is the patient to help guide them on their own risk and their family's risk. Great. Um, is there, there's some patients asking about where they can reference this information. <clears throat> is there a particular patient friendly uh, spot for patients to reference this? Yes. Uh, and I want to follow up to on the last oh. question. So for Thanks. For uh, an easy reference, one of my favorite places to go is mycancergenome.org. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a site that was created out of the University of Vanderbilt. A friend of mine, Mee Levy, started it uh, years ago. But what it does is it tracks all of the what are called somatic mutations. So that's the mutations that are in the tumor uh, and also associates the targeted therapies that are available for each of those mutations. It's a very easy site to read. Right. Uh, to navigate, and so I highly recommend that one. As for the testing, uh, it's not available today without a tumor per se, but there are things that happen. So as you are developing cancer in your body, some cancer cells will die, and some of that DNA will be shed into your bloodstream, and that is called circulating tumor DNA. A lot of diagnostic companies, just about every major molecular diagnostic company uh, in the country and probably around the world, are looking at how to detect circulating tumor DNA, as well as detect the mutations that may be responsible for a tumor starting, the BRAF, uh, the uh, EGFR, those sorts of things. And so we are getting to a point that now they are able to monitor cancer and actually even look at how is uh, treatment, how is your cancer responding to a particular treatment using circulator tuming, circulating tumor DNA. But I do believe in the near future that in with your son, as an example, that you would be able to use this technology to monitor them more closely such that you would know if a tumor was starting to form because they were able to detect this uh, particular circulating tumor DNA. And this is actually going to be the basis for what's called a multi-cancer early detection assays, which hopefully in the not too distant future will be much like a blood test so that when you have your cholesterol checked or other blood uh, chemistries done, that they will also be doing a circulating tumor DNA test to be able to know are you developing cancer somewhere in your body? So I think there's a lot of exciting things coming in the future. But unfortunately, today, if you do not have an active tumor, looking at somatic or tumor mutations uh, is very difficult and not available at this time. But in the near future, I do believe it will be. Great. Thank you. I want to back up just real quickly because we had a, quite a few questions patients and family members trying to understand the name of the um, genetic or the generic and the brand names of this treatment. Can we just review the, the generic name and the brand name so patients know which drugs um, we're talking about here or what names yes. they are? Trifluorouridine and Tiprosil are now called Lonsurf, L-O-N-S-U-R-F. Uh, so that's the combination. Uh, if you're looking at the uh, antibody that is used to block the VEGF uh, in uh, active activation, that is called uh, bezacivimab. Again, that's the generic name. Uh, most people know it as Avastin. Great. Uh, so, and that has been around for quite a while. And and really, what that does is again, it helps block the blood vessels going into the tumor, but it also has several other uh, anti-cancer effects uh, in addition to that. So. Those are the those are the two that we've been talking about, generic and commercial names. 
and Marianne, just to make it even worse, one of the ways we call lawn surf is TAS, T-A-S, no. dash 102. And because none of us can say trifluridine tipracil fast <laughs> enough. So, um, and we, anyway, so those are the three main names that you might see referenced in the literature or um, in discussion. Perfect. Thank you so much for that. We're getting close to the end. We have one um, last question. And then if I don't see any more, we can wrap this up. Um, one um, question a person had is, is there a reason to be concerned if you have a precancerous polyp? Is there anything for patients to do? I know we're talking about metastatic disease right now, but if you find a precancerous polyp, is there uh, reason for concern? I mean, th this is why we do colonoscopies, right? Yeah. To try and find things before they're cancer. Um, and um, so it, by itself, no, good news um, is what this is. Most K polyps don't actually turn into cancer, but some do. And so the idea behind them is to remove them before they do. Yeah. Um, the recommendations generally is after finding something like this is that your next one should be done a little sooner. Okay. Uh, we still are really struggling and debating about how often one should do a colonoscopy uh, and the like, and the guidelines have been kind of shifting around a bit. But first, glad you did one. And second, because you did one, the punishment for that is you're going to have to have another one, but uh, not for a few years, not for a few years. Okay. Thank you so much. And, and lastly, we have some questions around the slides. What the Alliance is going to do is this presentation is going to be posted in Blue HQ um, and other channels. Let me get make sure that you can find this. So everyone can find it on Facebook, on YouTube, and in our patient and caregiver platform specifically for our community called Blue HQ. Um, this um, presentation will be um, posted there. Um, well, I just wanted to go ahead and, and thank Dr. Marshall and the Alliance's own David Fenstermacher again for joining us today. I also thank to everyone who tuned in for this live discussion. Your participation helps us to better spread our message and increase awareness about colorectal cancer. Thank you to Taiho Oncology for supporting the broadcast and being an amazing partner of ours in our mission to end colorectal cancer in our lifetime. Finally, please share this video so we can help keep raising awareness about new life-saving treatments to better support the colorectal can cancer patients. And also, if you don't already know, please feel free to call us at the Alliance's free helpline at 877-422-2030 and you can speak to one of our certified patient and family support navigators and get the information and support you need. Thank you, everyone, and have a wonderful day. Wow.